Hey everybody, welcome to the SCTV Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Delaney, and I'm here with Brendan Sokler. Hey Brendan. Hey Michael, how's it going? It's going good, you sound far away. I am actually very far away, Michael. I am in New York City. Where are you? I'm at Echo Park. Well, it's good talking to you. Listen, I'm on a weird mic. You're far away. Let's get to it because we got a a packed show. We have the best guest you can possibly have for the SCTV podcast. We have Joe Flaherty. Yeah, we got Joe Flaherty, everybody. Of course, listeners, you know that Joe Flaherty was a cast member and writer for SCTV for all six seasons. In fact, he's the only cast member that was a a full-time actor-writer for the entire run of SCTV. So we've got him for this week. We're going to get right to it. But first, I'd like to thank Brendan Sokler for producing, Patrick Harvey for engineering, Gabe Flaherty for engineering and for making this podcast possible, And, of course, Will Hines for lending me a better microphone than the one I'm using right now. Well, Michael, without further ado, we should probably kick it. Let's get to it. So without any further interruption or business, here's my conversation with Joe Flaherty, recorded on June 21st, Joe's 81st birthday. My last few years, I wasn't doing any television or film or anything. I was just going up to Edmonton. And working with a group up there, they're called Die Nasty. Um, And uh, they're an improv group that have been together for years and years. So they're really great improvisers. And uh, every year they would do a show with a theme to it, a story, you know. And uh, then invite me up uh, to join them and to, you know, in the improvisations in that particular show. So I'd go up there and uh, and improvise. And uh, it was fun. It was really, I got a big kick out of it. Of course, he... Dana Anderson, the guy who runs it, he's an ex-Second City guy. Um, he just loved my Robert Mitchum, so he, <laughs> he'd always have me come up as Robert Mitchum dressed like he was in the Night of the Hunter. Uh, <laughs> no matter what the show was, I'd be, you know, Preacher Harry, <laughs> Preacher Harry Powell, yeah. So, uh, uh, but it was always fun. I, I enjoyed it, and um, it got a little bit toward the end there. It was tricky. It got tricky because... Uh, you know the memory. Uh, you're 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 just not functioning as sharply as you used to. And uh, I mean, improv is great. You don't have to memorize lines, which is really tough when you get to a certain point. Um, you you know the lines just you can't you can't retain them. You know you learn them, you get them down pat, and they just whew, fly away. But uh, improvising is good because you didn't have any lines to remember, but you did have um, names to remember, like character names. <laughs> Like if if yes. if, Di- if uh, da- that's hard enough. Yeah, Dana was playing a guy <laughs> say called Jonah, or something like that. I'd uh, uh, you know I'd I'd say, well, listen, let me tell you something, and then I'd pause. Oh, jeez, what's his name? <laughs> what what's this guy's name? Doesn't quite work. As I well. hate that. Oh, I know. In life is bad enough, but when you're on stage, whenever I'm whispering to someone <laughs> on stage, I'm probably asking them what my name is. <laughs> you know, I saw Dana Anderson way back in the I want to say late '80s in Toronto, Second City, and he was such a standout. I, I thought he was just tremendous. Oh uh, yeah, he's good. Yes, I, I, and uh, you know that you remember? I don't know if he did a sketch with uh, Mike Myers. He was in the same company as Mike Myers, and they uh-huh. they did. They did the sketch with the two German guys, Dieter and somebody, and then uh, oh, that must when, have become Sprocket. Yes, yes, and and then when he left on Saturday Night Live, he just took that character and uh, ran with it. Well, I also uh, my, saw Myers doing the Wayne character at Second City right. Toronto, but I also saw that on tour down in South Florida. The Chicago company did it on tour before the whole <laughs> Wayne's World thing. So that that sketch made the rounds before he got a movie out of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Oh, um, boy. boy, what a great cast that was in Toronto um, um, back then. I, I haven't been yeah. since, but I, I don't even know if they're still going now. Uh, that's a good question. La- uh, last I heard on that Second City site, there's a site on there for the Second City stage in Toronto, the Toronto site. They're wondering, too, if they're ever going to open that theater up. And um, right now, I don't think it's open. I don't think it's open. Well, I, I think it'd be a, a, a pity and a crying shame if there were not a Toronto Second City. Um, hey, Joe, what kind of improvisation were you exposed to pre-Second City? 
Pre Second City? Yes. Um, if any. Oh yeah, I was I was exposed to I you know I I studied acting in New York. I went to New York, um, and I wanted to basically learn the method, you know, uh, the Stanislavski method. Um, yes, I studied method myself. Did you? Okay, so uh, so they would have us improvise uh, occasionally, occasionally, not too often, but uh, we would have to improvise. But that was dramatic improvisation, you know. It's uh, you know if you don't leave that woman alone, I'm gonna you know that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, <laughs> Dramatic, and uh, and then when I went uh, back to Pittsburgh, um, I I went to the Point Park um, Pittsburgh Playhouse University, and I and I took up acting there, and that was theatrical acting, um, really based in theater, you know, the pretty much the old time theater, <laughs> and uh, that was they were concerned more with voice and movement and stuff like that, but they would have us improvise occasionally. But it, once again, not comedy. It was, uh, you know, drama. And then um, from my th- from that theater experience I had going to, you know, at Point Park University, uh, we had a group in at the time working at the Playhouse from Goodman Theater in Chicago. And one of the guys was Mike Miller. And uh, when I left, after a year, I, I said, well, you know, I'm getting too old now to be going to still going to college. I'm, you know, I should be making a career of myself. And I wrote him a letter not expecting anything. And I said, you know, Mike, uh, what's going on? Do you think, uh, can you get find a job for me anywhere, an acting job? And he said, and he wrote back and said, yeah, Joe, um, I'm, in, I'm with this uh, group here in Chicago called Second City. I'm directing the show and um, uh, I don't need an actor, but you know, I do need a stage manager and a lighting man. Do you know anything about lights? And of course, all actors do the same. It's like, can you ride a horse? Uh-huh. I said, yeah, oh yeah, I know about lights. <laughs> I did. Nothing, nothing about lighting. So I went into, he said, okay, come on in. And I went into Chicago and I was the uh, stage manager, lighting man. And my res- main responsibility was uh, taking the lights out. Well, you'd run the lights during the show, you know, all the light cues and everything. But during the improvisations, you had to watch those closely because it was up to the lighting man to end the right. improvs. Whenever it looked like it came came to an ending, I'd, you know, uh, you'd take the lights out. So I'd have to watch those improvs carefully and I'd watch what all those guys were doing. And the guy I replaced, <laughs> it was apparently he he was a he was a real druggie. He, he was into all kinds of drugs, and he'd be up there running the lights on LSD and I don't know what other <laughs> drugs. But he'd be he'd let scenes go on way too long, you know. Uh, <laughs> Nothing's boring when you're on LSD. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then other times he'd take the lights, you know, and they'd do a couple of lines, and the lights would go out. And he said, "What the hell?" So anyway. Bill Noble, I think was his name. Anyway, so I had to do that, and I'd watch them closely, and I really, uh, well, I, you know, I got to love what they were doing on stage at Second City. I, I'm, I'm like a, the, all, a lot of these people that join Second City, they just watch the shows and love it, you know, and say, boy, I'd like to be doing that. And um, fortunately, uh, after about six months, Bernie shipped that, Bernie Sollins, the producer, shipped that entire company out to New York and decided to, start a new company and uh i got into that just by luck um by my by my good fortune and uh garrett graham's bad fortune <laughs> okay did he did you replace him or did he get did he get the, yeah they get the boot yeah that's what happened they they had their own the touring company by the way they were getting a reputation and in, in that touring company harold ramus was in it uh and also uh brian murray was in it and uh jim fisher and um they they were doing rude funny stuff, really good stuff, and uh, and also this guy Garrett Graham, who was a really good actor, really good. Unfortunately, he's 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 quite a jerk, you know. He's pretty much of an asshole. Nobody liked working with him. They they didn't. And so when Bernie was picking, he said, "Okay, we got the cast." And then they said, "Well, we don't want to work with Garrett." And and, and he said, "Oh, okay, all right. Then uh, uh, we got to get somebody else for Garrett." And Jim Fisher said, "What about Joe?" And Bernie said, he's a stage manager, manager, you know, he's a lighting man. He and they said, no, no, Bernie, he's worked with us in the improvs. Give him a shot. And they put me in the company. And so I went in, and that's how that started. So you did you learn to improvise then by osmosis when you were just sitting in with the cast? It start, No, you know, Second City at the time had a children's show, and it was directed by Joe Forsberg. Now, Joe Forsberg used to have workshops, improv workshops. And uh, I would take those improv workshops. It was all based on the Viola Spolin method of uh, improvisation. 
and um, so I was I was learning about improv through those classes, and then I and then in the children's show I'd go out and I'd improvise, um, and so I was getting you know accustomed to it, and I, I thought I was getting all right, I was getting all right, and so yeah, I went into the cast, and um, and boy, that was a lucky stroke there because from that point on, I just Chicago, I love Chicago, Second City, I just love Second City itself. I wanted to honestly, I wanted to do it for the rest of my life. Joe, we all feel that way about our comedy theaters. Yeah, because uh, after I was in Chicago four years, uh, four, yeah, I was going on four and a half years, uh, Bernie Sollins, the producer, said, I'm thinking about opening a theater up in Toronto, <laughs> Canada. Uh, and he said, is anybody interested in going up there? And at the time, now this is 1974, nobody knew about Toronto uh, uh, in in, in in Canada, Toronto, Ontario. The only city we knew of was Montreal. That's the one that we heard in school, you know, when you'd learn about Canada and then there's Montreal. But nobody knew anything about Toronto. You know, what the hell is Toronto? And uh, so nobody wanted to go up. Only two people went up, me and Brian Murray. We said, well, okay, we'll go up. And we uh, came, went up with Del Close, who was directing the show at that time, and um, Bernie Sollins. Four of us went up there and uh, held auditions to see if we could get a theater going in Toronto. Well, uh, Joe, now that you bring up Del Close, you know, he famously yeah. was involved in the sort of, uh, the big me- sort of meeting slash conversation about the genesis of SCTV and, and what to actually mm. do. But I was wondering mm. what your r- relationship and involvement with Dell was before that, that if you had worked with him, and particularly if you'd worked uh, with him on the Herald. Uh, we worked, uh, oh yeah, Bernie, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, Dell came in, down from the committee, he was working with the committee, came to uh, Chicago and uh, wanted to have some workshops. And we all, and the cast said, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's do some workshops. And Bernie said, okay, I'll let you, uh, you know, I'll let Bern, uh, Bedell conduct workshops with you guys. So he did. He conducted workshops with us, taught us about the um, Herald. And who was us at the time? Besides you and Brian Murray. It was me, Brian, Harold Ramis, John Belushi, um, Eugenie Ross Lemming and Judy Morgan. Great that group. was our cast. Wow. Yeah. 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 It was a good group. And, um, and so, yeah, so he came down and Dell was, he would hold, you know, the, uh, he'd have, he'd have the, uh, improv classes and, um, um, we, we treated him like a, a prince, you know, uh, every, we were all in awe of him when we, you know, when we were at his feet and he was, had this philosophy of, uh, improvisation didn't tell us he'd share with us you know yes and and uh, all of that stuff uh, but you know ensemble work group work that was very important to him and so yeah he put us through all of that and he and we started putting the Harold in our sets I gotta say I wasn't a big fan of it but um back in those days um I didn't like it too much I, I didn't like the fact that everything got out of control and uh, went in directions you, you never knew he would uh-huh. go, <laughs> and it was still pretty much. He was still experimenting with it. So, uh, but it would, the form was there, and it was interesting. I thought, boy, this is like um, filmmaking. You know, you just, you know, you just a bunch have different stories, and you're editing, you're cross cutting mm-hmm. all the time between story and story. But anyway, we uh, put a show together. Uh, Dell helped direct some of the scenes, and um, and then one of them was uh, Hamlet. We did Hamlet. That seemed to be pretty popular where it was based on an idea I brought into the workshop. I said, you know, I was just thinking about the play Hamlet, and I said, you know, everybody gets killed in that. Everybody dies. Uh, everybody, including Hamlet. And I said, well, what if we did something where after these guys die, they all go up into, you know, like into heaven or limbo or something like that. Mm-hmm. All the characters all the characters pick up where they left off on Earth, and um, Dell thought that was a good idea, so we did that as a, a sketch. And uh, it worked pretty well. Um, I remember uh, Brian Murray played uh, King, uh, oh, no, I forget his name, Hamlet's father. It was the guy Claudius. Who, uh, yes, Claudius. Claudius. That's Claudius, it. Claudius. Claudius. Thank Claudius. You, Very good. Everyone, that was yeah. Brendan Sokler, a true Shakespearean, uh, who came to our yes. rescue. <laughs> yes. Uh, of course, yeah. And uh, so that worked pretty well. We had some good jokes for that. And um, well, Del loved Hamlet. Played. He had a love affair with Hamlet, so that's one of his favorite subjects. Yes, he did. All right. Yes, yes. Uh, shuffle off this mortal coil. He, yeah, he liked it a lot. 
And uh, as I said, Brian played uh, played King uh, Claudius. He played, yeah, he played Claudius as uh, Bob Dylan. Oh, uh, nice. He had a, uh, <laughs> he had a harmonica. And anyway, it it was it went pretty well, and uh, Dell like that. So then we the cast said uh, to Bernie, we said, by the way, at this point, Bernie was getting he was our director. He was directing all the shows. Yeah, and he was getting a little bit jealous of uh, all the attention we were paying mm. Dell. And we came to we said to Bernie, Bernie, we want Dell to direct our next show. And uh, he wasn't happy about it, but uh-huh. <laughs> since the cast all wanted, he said, "Okay, I'll, I'll let him do that." I think fully expecting Dell to fall on his face or something. I don't know what, but but um, so we started working on a show, and Dell was great. I mean, I I came up with three or four ideas in that thing that really worked well. I came up with an idea for a funeral uh, funeral sketch, which sort of became a classic there for a while. The the Van Camp's uh, Bean sketch. Yes, yeah. yes, oh, yeah. yes. That's, that's, an, that. that's one of the enduring sketches. Yeah, yeah. I remember coming in one day uh, for rehearsal, you know, and um, we I would always do my homework. I'd try to think of uh, ideas. And uh, Del, Del said, oh, does anybody have any ideas? <laughs> and um, uh, I, I said, yeah, Del, I was just thinking. Um, I was thinking about if someone... Someone say walked out of their house and they started down. It was it was icy and cold out and it was the steps were slippery and he just slips on the ice on his stairs and lands on his head and I thought yeah that's kind of a you don't want to go out that way you know he just falling down the stairs and landing on your head dying um, I said so if it's kind of an embarrassment I said we it'd be funny if somebody dies in an embarrassing way and. Uh, Bill and Dell liked that, and he said, uh, "How about he gets his head stuck in a can of uh, Van Camp's <laughs> <laughs> pork and beans?" <laughs> and I said, "Yes, perfect, perfect." And we and we took it from there, and we just uh, we improvised it. And the improvisation on opening on that first improv we did was the one we kept. We never changed it. We didn't alter it at all. Isn't that and amazing? Then we had, That's amazing. Yeah, how it oh, works yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. It just turned out to be a good premise, and uh, and. Uh, which, by the way, Mary Tyler, the Mary Tyler Moore show stole from us, but that's another thing altogether. Oh, yeah, uh, with the clown. Yes, yeah, they did that. I'm convinced that uh, one of those writers saw our show and, uh, and stole that. But uh, So we had that, plus a bunch of other f- good sketches. Uh, um, I-, I got a chance to do a, um, a t- <laughs> my favorite. And this is just, it was just slapstick, pretty much comedy. It was a farce. It was a farce. Uh, you know, based on those old 1940s movies with Nazis and stuff, people getting killed in a hotel left and right. Uh-huh. Uh, Harold Harold played the uh, he played the house dick, and uh, and uh, I was uh, oh I was just I was the like the lead character with Eugenie Gene um, um, Jim Fisher was the bellhop, and and um, John Belushi was uh, just I forget what he was. Well, he was supposed to be a Nazi. He was a Nazi spy. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> we just we just built this scene around exits and en- entrances and exits. A game, by the way, you play in mm-hmm. um, in uh, Viola Spolin's and yeah, uh, teaching. You know, the exits. Yeah. That's one of the games. Exits and entrances. That's all we did was in and out of doors down this dumb waiter. We created this stupid dumb waiter. Uh, big audience favorite. They loved it. I gave Belushi a line. I said, uh, I said, John, when you come in next time. You know, Harold was playing the house dick, and and just say when you when you enter, just say I saw a dick hanging out in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, big laughs, and uh, so it was fun. I liked working with Belushi at that point. I liked Harold, loved working with Harold. It was great. So, um, but Belushi didn't want to go up to Canada. He didn't want to start that thing up in Canada. He had his own sights fixed on something else, which yeah. ended up to be National Lampoon, mm. and. Uh, so we went up to Canada, me, Dell, Bernie, and um, Brian, and Joyce Sloan, who also uh, helped get the thing together. Didn't and you so, do National Lampoon also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, after. That was after we got, we went up to Toronto, and we, we, we were worrying. We thought, oh, geez, we got to start a theater here. Can anybody improvise here, you know, in Canada? It's, uh, do they know anything about improvisation? We thought, oh boy, oh Andy, mm. let's let's hold these auditions. <laughs> mm. So Bernie, for some reason, saw a production in Toronto of Godspell, and he thought it was good. And he said, I want you guys to see see that and see if there's anybody there that you want to use. 
So we went in and we saw it. And uh, Gene Levy was in it. He played he played Jesus in it. Uh, Gilda Radner was in it. Yeah, that's uh, a famous production now. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Quite Martin well Short. I think, uh, uh, wasn't Dave Thomas in it also? In- Dave was just an understudy at that point, mm. but uh, Jane Eastwood was uh, also in it, and and so we said, "Wow, you know, we bring some of these people in." And uh, no, no, they they showed up. They showed up on their own. They wanted they wanted to uh, audition for Second City. So on that first day of improv, I mean, uh, the first day of casting, through the door w- walks Dan Aykroyd with Valerie Brumfield, mm. Gil- Gilda Radner, Gene Levy, John Candy, and who else? Gilda, oh yeah, of course, and Jane Eastwood, who we wanted in the show. And um, that, that, was the, that was, the, those are the people that showed up for the cat, yeah. And um, later on, uh, I think Marty, I wonder if Marty and, uh, Marty Short and Dave auditioned, I can't remember, but uh, they, everybody auditioned and we loved, I thought, well, God, you know, let's let's get these people. You know, they're good, and uh, and and we wanted, and so we we decided on obviously we wanted to go with the Gilda. Uh, Brian Murray loved Gilda. He thought she was the best. We loved Janie Jane uh, Eastwood. Uh, who else? Um, oh, uh, Gene. There's a, uh, we wanted to use Gene. We thought his improvs were funny, but Jane. But that Bernie didn't like him, and he wanted to use somebody else. He, Jerry. He <laughs> poor Jerry. <laughs> And so, so we didn't get to use Gene, but um, it was a trade-off. Um, if John Candy, Del, Del Close said, "I want uh, John Candy down in Chicago," so he went. John went down to Toronto, and everybody else went into the cast. So that was the cast opening night. There was me, Brian, uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Gilda Radner, Jane Eastwood, and um, Valerie, and um, that was that was our cast. And it was a good show. We did a damn good show. And Del, um, Del stole John Candy and brought... I, I've heard that other places. I, I always wondered how that actually played out. He just swiped him. No, uh, well, he didn't swipe him. It was a deal. He said, uh, all right, uh, look, um, um, if, you, uh, give me, uh, if you give me John Candy, um, I'll let you have... What the hell what was it? Was it Gene? Eugene Levy, I guess. I guess it was Gene at the time, yeah. Wow. But then Bernie didn't want Gene, so we had to go with Jerry Salzburg. But um, no, well, I guess Bernie uh, was wrong on wrong again, Bernie. Sorry, wrong, wrong again, <laughs> wrong again. Boy was, and he was jealous of Dell too. He really was jealous of Dell. When that show was a success, by the way, that one that Dell directed, <laughs> Bernie had a hard time with it, really hard time. But <laughs> well, Dell was a consummate so, artist. He was really an artist at heart, wasn't oh, he? Oh yeah, yeah. He he true. Yeah, he was. He had everything going for him that a, that a. A mad artist has yes. going for him, you know. Right. He was he was unbalanced. He was slightly unbalanced. He could be not very pleasant to some people. It seems like uh, he was a man who was completely in touch with his demons and was comfortable mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I guess he was. I know that he came up to Toronto to teach some. Uh, once we were going, we had a stage show going on on uh, Lombard Street. He came up. Uh, Andrew Alexander, our producer, said, I'm, I want to bring Dell up to hold some workshops. And at that time, Dave Thomas was in the cast with Catherine O'Hara, you know, some other people. And um, so they were having a workshop, and Dell said to Dave Thomas, he said, uh, I want you to recreate a scene. I want you and so, I don't know who else was in it. He said, I want you to be my father, and so and so can be the son. No, no, I, I want you to be me. And then somebody plays the father, and he puts him, puts him on a knee, and then he puts a gun up to his head and commits suicide. Um, while the kid is on the knee, I want you to play the kid. And Dave said, "No, I'm not going to do that. That's fucking. That's horrible. I don't. I don't know what comedy we can get out of that." Uh, so they just didn't like Dell at all. The Toronto cast, the one that later was there. It did sound so, like uh, at that period of his life, he was working some stuff out and felt like working it out on stage, which, yeah, isn't always the most fun for the audience. No, no, no. I think it depended when you caught Dell at what phase of his life he was. It seemed like he had a lot of different masks almost or, or uh, layers. Well, yes. And and there was, a, there was a story behind that, too. I mean, that particular cast, and I include the Hamilton Mafia there, that'd be Dave... Martin Short, Gene Levy, <laughs> um, they they were showbiz guys. They love showbiz. You know, Gene idolized George Burns. Uh, Marty loved Jerry Lewis. Um, Dave 
and also who was the, who was the the other guy that Paul Schaefer was part of that group too. Um, yeah, they love showbiz, you know, yes. and uh, and and they didn't care about you know uh, acting as such, improvisation uh, as such. Uh, they they wanted jokes. They wanted to do jokes pretty much, and and so that was a clash there for sure. That was the way they liked to. That was the way they operated, and uh, and. It was okay. It worked out okay. They just weren't interested in, in the serious parts of improvisation, you know, the art. They were not interested in art at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> showbiz. It was showbiz. Right. It's not show they art. Were, it's show business. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what happened there. So, yeah, anyway, the, the thing closed. Uh, we did a good show, but because Bernie neglected to get air conditioning for that theater on... Uh, Adelaide Street, and also he he neglected to get a liquor license for the cabaret, so there was no liquor and no air conditioning. That show just tanked, and uh, uh, that Christmas it closed, and it you know at that point Second City was dead in Toronto. But but about five four or five months later, I got a phone call when I was down in Pittsburgh. I got a call from Andrew Alexander said I want to keep going with this show. I want Second City. I want to start up a new Second City here in Toronto. And uh, he says, I also got, I, I got some people lined up. I got Gene Levy, John Candy, and Gilda Radner interested. They said they'd do it if you would do it and direct it. All right. And I said, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, so um, so we, I went up to Toronto and on Lombard Street and started again trying to open a theater up in, uh, in, in Toronto. But uh. we, we had a good cast, me, John Candy, Gene Levy, Gilda Radner, pretty good cast. And, um, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we did a good couple of really good, sh- funny shows. Funny shows. And um, Andrew had this idea of dinner theater, which I thought, oh, geez, you know, that's not Second City. Yeah. You know, Second City is cabaret, like the German cabarets in pre-World War II <laughs> Germany. <laughs> but, you know, the Chicago part was always, was more art. You know, it was more serious. It was uh in, intellectual you know yeah the toronto part was because we had that mafia that hamilton it was more comedy uh. just plain comedy you know and so but it worked out okay you know because bernie would come up and help direct some of the scenes and we'd do scenes that he felt met the criterion of a of a good chicago second city show mm. some smart stuff and so so that got going and then i got a call from john belushi who was down at that point down in new york doing the National Lampoon Radio Hour. He had just done Lemmings. Big hit. Yeah. Huge hit. And um, he said, I, he said uh, they want me to put a show together going on tour. He said, uh, and I'd like to bring you down and Harold and, and Gilda and Brian. He said, we can work on the radio show here while we get a show together to go on the road. And so that's what happened. We went down there. And it was the best gig I ever had, you know, because... Wow. Uh, I was living in New York and getting paid decent money. I'd never had that before. The times I was living in New York before, I just had these crappy jobs to get me, you know, through acting classes. And here I was making some money and, oh, John, it was fun. Plus, I got a chance to meet Chris Guest and and, uh, they would come in and do the show and Chevy Chase and those guys. So pretty good crew there. Did that show show come to fruition? Yeah, yeah. What, What was it ultimately? Well, now, they gave... John Belushi carte blanche to direct it, <laughs> create it and direct it. Uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do? He had his, uh, well, he had this thing now. He thought the lampoon. Yeah. You know, cause the lampoon was pretty, the magazine itself was pretty popular at that time, yeah. you know, and it had its own style, its own, and it was its own philosophy, which was attack everyone, you know, make fun of everyone you know not just certain people not just the typical targets but everyone and so and that's sort of what what lemmings did you know and uh he so john had this philosophy the audience likes when you attack anything and especially if you attack them he says if you call them assholes or jerks they love it they love it <laughs> so, so we came oh, we no. came out the opening the opening of our show was us coming out wearing our underwear or BBDs on our heads mm-hmm. and singing this song, You're the Pits, on based on uh, You're the Tops. I think it was Gershwin's You're the Tops. You're yeah. the, telling the audience they're the pits 
and pointing to them, uh, <laughs> you know, your your California hockey, those kind of things. Uh, okay. We just come, so we come on mm-hmm. and insult the audience right off the bat. And um, but they booked us in these weird places. Uh, what was the name of the show? Uh, you know, I don't know if it had a name other than the National Lampoon Stage Show. Oh, so it was under the Lampoon's banner. Oh yeah. I yeah. see. I see. I see. Yeah. So we had we had fun getting it together. I mean, I like working with once again working with Harold and Gilda and John and Brian and uh, Bill Bill Murray came on to join us later on. But um, but they booked us in these places. Uh, they were like bar bars. Some of them were biker bars uh, <laughs> up in Canada. Everything was all our bookings at the, at first were up in Canada, London, Ontario, and huh. you know it's these kind of tough bars, tough audience, you know, and we. They were coming in expecting to see a, a, a music group, you know, that they could let loose with, and then they come in and see us <laughs> with your underwear on doing, your head, insulting them. Yeah, on our head, tell, <laughs> insulting them. Yes, telling them they're the pits. Yeah, I'd look out, and, and boy, they had some growl, you know, on their faces or scowls, and um, I thought we would get it, get attacked. <laughs> I remember Harold once reached into his pocket and pulled out a five dollar bill because I think that's what the surcharge was, and and he yeah. just tossed it down to one of those bikers, <laughs> giving him his money back. Oh no! Who was giving us? Uh, yeah, the audiences were. It was a, the bookings were pretty bad, and uh, but you know what happened was eventually after we finished London and some of the other gigs, uh, they got us a gig in in um, Toronto at a place called the El Macombo, uh, which was a popular club there very popular club uh, you know played rock music and uh, a lot of a lot of young people went there and uh, he he got us a gig there and so we went in there and did the show and uh andrew alexander was in the audience and who else was there? geez who else was in the audience there ivan reitman was in the audience mm. and um so we did the show and um you know once again they all those people came in to see uh, music and they were not that happy, but we, we finally won them over. But Ivan Reitman thought, and Andrew agreed, it, it was a really good cast. And so he said, I want to do something with these guys. And so we had one more gig. We had to play a university in um, Pennsylvania, Scranton, not Scranton, Allentown. Um, we went there to do that. And then I said, I'm, I'm leaving, guys. I don't like doing this show anymore. Mm-hmm. I called up Andrew. I said, do you have anything going at Second City? Uh, you know, I, I'd love to get back. He said, sure, come on back. I'll let you direct the next show. And um, But Ivan Reitman was there again and said, okay, you guys, I want to open up. I'm going to get a theater for us and off Broadway, and I want you guys to do this show. And so he got the cast, the cast together, and they did a show off Broadway that Lorne Michaels went in to see, and Lorne Michaels loved it. And uh, that's what happened. He, he Picked, those were the people we picked for Saturday Night Live. I went back to Second City, and um, and um, Brian and Gilda, and I guess Harold, Harold and uh, Bill Murray, they were all part of that cast. And uh, oh, Danny Aykroyd came on board too. Did part of you want to go after the SNL? We thing? didn't know what the hell that was going to be. We knew that I know we knew that Lorne Michaels was a producer in Canada. He had done some the Lorne Michaels Comedy Hour or something. It, it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. He, he, you know, so nobody thought he was a comic genius or anything like that. Um, so that um, that's how that sort of evolved. Except, interestingly enough, he didn't take Bill Murray right. uh, for for the cast. He uh, he, but Bill Murray ended up on Howard Cosell's Saturday Night Live show. The, the, the original Saturday Night yes, Live. Yes, I w- actually tuned in live when I was a boy. Did you? Did you? Boy, there was an explosion. But I loved that about Toronto at the time. As I said, an explosion of lots of things going on um, in entertainment, in, uh, uh, you know, restaurants, and uh, all sorts of things. It was it was growing. The city was, blow, you know, just, just uh, becoming a big city, you know, a big popular city. So that was fun being there so anyway that that's what happened there um i went back to um i went back to to toronto to direct the next show with jane with uh gene was in it gene levy was in it danny Aykroyd was in it um who else was in it at the time oh Catherine o'hara had made it into that show she sort of replaced gilda you know and i had to go in and i heard there was troubles (laughs) troubles oh on the set yeah yeah they didn't like the director they they 
disliked him intensely. And uh, plus, there was there was some romantic stuff that was happening. The, there was a clash of uh, a couple guys had had the hots for Catherine. You know, <laughs> oh, well, that's unsurprising. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, oh, so that caused a they, problem. They, yeah, it did for some reason. Uh, yeah. And uh, when I came up to do that show, I replaced Sheldon, who was the director, who they all wanted to get rid of. They hated him. And uh, I had no idea. They were known as the Snake Pit cast. That's what Sheldon said. He said, well, <laughs> good, luck, good luck with these guys. Uh, and then Dave Thomas was also in there, too. And he's uh, Dave can be quite an operator. But uh, And that was the cast I got stuck with. But, you know, I got them together, and, and uh, I said, let's just have fun. And um, I didn't care about relationships, and it it worked out nicely. We got a, we got a funny, good, funny show together. Now, Joe, were you in and it, or it, were you just directing? I was directing, and I was in it. I was in it, and uh, it was a good show, and uh, and everything was working nicely. And then Bernie comes up and says, "How many guys? How, who wants to go to Los Angeles and open a show?" And we all looked at each other and thought, <laughs> "L.A. Second City, sure, yeah." And, uh, so me and. Uh, John Candy was in that show too, by the way. I forgot to mention Johnny. John was in it, uh-huh. and uh, and uh, me, John, Eugene, and uh, who else? I guess it was just me, John, Eugene. So we went to. Uh, we all said, Ah, Los Angeles, we're opening up a show in L.A. You know, Hollywood. And when we got there, we found out that the show he he booked us a place in Pasadena, mm. outside of L.A. in a shopping center in mm. a shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> There we were at a shopping mall in Pasadena, uh, you know. Oh boy! So, but while while we were there, we got a call from. Uh, well, we knew John was going to come down. We knew John was going to be in a show. Uh, we got a call, and Dan Aykroyd said, "I want to come down and uh, and uh, join the show if you guys don't mind." And we said, "Sure." And so he drove down with John. They both drove down in record time. They got down to the theater, it's in Pasadena. That sounds like and Dan Aykroyd. Th- yes. Oh yeah, yeah. He, you know, and by the way, they yeah broke all sorts of speed records uh-huh. and laws getting down. <laughs> and uh, they get there, and Daddy comes in for the first day of rehearsal. So we're we're talking about scenes and stuff, and uh, somebody comes in and says, "Oh, Dan, you have a phone call." Okay, so he goes out, comes back a- uh, after a little while. Well, I just got a call from Lauren Michaels. He's got this show he's putting together. He went. It's going to be on NBC Television. He wants me to be in it. And uh, he said, what do you think? And we all said, geez, I don't know. I said, NBC television, do it, Danny. We all said, do it. He said, okay, I'm going to do it. So he, he, said, turned, pardon me, he turned around and just took off, went back, went to New York. Gone. And uh, yeah. And so that show began while we were doing that cheap show in Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, oh boy. Uh, did you have a feeling at the time that you had been put out to pasture, Second City style? Sort of, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. They, uh, I mean, the small audiences. Nobody in the Pasadena heard of Second City. That you know, they didn't care. Yeah, it, you know, and so it just bought, it just petered out. It petered out in um, the end of the year in '75. So there I was without work again, and um, so '76 comes along, and Andrew says, "You want to direct a show here in in." Uh, Toronto, and I said, sure, 76, back to Toronto. So I went back to Toronto, directing the Second City show, and that's when I, uh, Bernie said, uh, uh, Andrew said, uh, we have a meeting uh, coming up, Bernie Bernie and I, and um, we want to do a television show because uh, this Saturday Night Live thing is, you know, they're using all of Second, Second City's talent to make put their put their shows together. Yeah. He said, we want to do our own show, and, uh, and we have an offer from Global Television, Global TV in Ontario, only in Ontario. Uh, they want to do a, a half-hour show with the Second City, and so we had a meeting on that. And uh, and at that meeting, I was there with Jerry Appleton from Global, and and also Andrew Alexander, Bernie Bernie Solins. And they said, "Well, Joe, who do you want in the cast?" And so I said, "Well, uh, I'd like to have Gene Levy in the cast. He's strong, good performer, good writer. Uh, I want to have Catherine. She's great. I love her on stage." I want to have John Candy. I love him. Um, and then I said, well, and then uh, there's two people in the cast right now, Dave and Andrea Martin. I said, well, I'd like to use them. And then I said, and then for another performer, head writer, see if we can get Harold Ramis uh, to do it. It's just dinky half hour show in, in Canada. And because uh, he had, by that time, he had gone on, 
he was writing scripts, you know, for films and stuff. Yeah. And, and I said, I'd love to Harold to be performer actor on a show. And to my surprise, they called up Harold and he said, sure, I'll do it. So Harold came up as head writer and performer. And that was our cast. How important did the addition of Harold Ramis end up being? Immensely, immensely important. Uh, from the standpoint of writing. Harold never considered himself at that point a actor, but he did choose to be in the cast too. And so he was in the cast and-, and uh, Well, he always smiled was, when he was on camera. Yeah. Regardless of the situation. <laughs> yeah, you, you got that, you got that, that's right. He had that Jerry Seinfeld thing. And uh, and I used, I used to, of course, enjoy throwing a little improv, improvising sometimes and catching him off guard and sometimes he just said chuckle actually chuckle on camera but yeah he was not great at that uh and he, he always said he, well, he wasn't an actor well he was the exception he was the only member of the sctv cast who laughed on camera. oh yeah yeah you know and he, you know what i think he didn't think the show was going anywhere he didn't think he just thought it was a chance to work with a bunch of good people for a short while um try out some ideas i he didn't he thought the show well he knew i mean our show consisted of it was the Global Television Network. They called it a network, but they only had six or seven stations in Ontario. So we were only on six stations in Ontario. Period. Tiny, most of, yeah. <laughs> and only two of the cities, Toronto, I think, and one of the other ones was big enough. The other ones were dinky little towns. And that was it. But that was our show. I have, and it was once a month. It was a once a month. Uh, once <laughs> a know, month? What the hell? Once a month. Our show was on and um, um, originally, and then after we did a couple, the the globals people said, "You know what? I I think we'll put this show on weekly." But it was only a small audience that was watching us, and uh, Harold was just doing it to for fun and to work with us. But he had other things in mind. He was he wanted to write a movie at that point. Would and, would that um, become Animal House? Yeah, it would. It would definitely become Animal House. Yes. So can I ask at, at that time? You know, we brought up the Harold before, which is kind of an improvisational form where stories kind of uh, start to, there's a few different stories happening at the same time and they begin to intertwine. Mm -hmm. I noticed that that phenomenon happened in the SCTV episodes, particularly the very first three, where one was like mm -hmm. kind of backstage, the other was the, there was a murder and you guys did that, that um, a, a war, oh, yeah. a war picture. And then the third one was right. gypsies. You guys came hard after the gypsies. <laughs> In the third episode, what and would the, not would the, not let it go. You hammered them for the whole I, episode, I, all I gypsies. Know. Now, now I, it, it it felt like that thing of <laughs> if you want to talk about gypsies, we can. But it felt like that thing <laughs> of really going for the theme was something that was hit yeah, hard at yeah. the beginning, but maybe then was not hit so hard as it went on. Right, exactly. Yeah, we had to. You know, we had to have a program. Everybody knows how we started the show. We had that meeting, you know, and uh, yeah, that's a famous and I, one. And I said, I, you know what, guys, I want to do television parodies. I, I said it's the most fun when we're on stage. Whenever we do a TV parody, a TV commercial, or something, the audience picks up on it right away. They love them. And I said, so let's do television. We'll be on television. Let's do par television parodies. Okay. And then, uh, and then Dell said at that brainstorming session, Dell said, well, what about if we're a television station? Uh, our own television station and uh, we're putting out product you know and uh okay great great and then um sheldon tinkin said uh why don't we start it with uh, a programming day 24 hours we'll start with uh sunrise semester and end up with uh with words to live by or whatever the sermonette right sermonettes so, yeah so that's how we started it and uh we were just you know groping around in the dark <laughs> we had we had to the first show, by the way, was about an hour long. We had shot an hour's worth of material. Um, we had uh, five or six sketches, plus this big wraparound story with John Candy as Johnny LaRue, um, who was losing his grip because he felt he was being replaced by the, by the, big, the big wheels at uh, SCTV. So we had a backstory with him, and that's what we did. And... Um, he, he was backstage and having his problems. We did yep. drum, dramatic scenes with John. John, no, not dramatic, but John lose, John getting f worried about getting fired. And then we sort of, Harold and I sort of thought we could go Python-esque a little bit and break that, you know, fourth wall by, by uh, 
by actually interfering with a performance. We'd have John doing a sketch, and then we'd have us. No, we'd have somebody else doing a sketch, and we'd have John yes, break into the sketch. Then John breaks through. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We would do that, and so we did that. We we considered that a little Python esque uh, uh, for that show, and um, and some you know, and then we had uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I think we kept this so. Uh, Harold and I came up with this idea of uh, the life of Betty Freud. Yes. Sigmund, girls Sigmund of, Freud's. Y- y- you tagged it as Girls of Vienna. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, the Girls, girls of Vienna. Vienna. <laughs> like with episode Betty, whatever. Betty Freud. Yeah. yeah. Betty Freud, who was basically Betty Ford, that, you know, the vice, the president's daughter, vice president's uh, wife. But anyway. Okay. I that, I, I, but I love that idea. You know, of Betty, Betty, you know, we'll, we'll do Sigmund Freud from the angle of, of his wife, which wasn't Betty, by the way. <laughs> I forget what her actual name was. And that was our Chicago sort of, um, you know, a cultural uh, approach to the show. You know, using using references that, you know, people had to know a little bit about. You got to know something about Freud. You know, uh, you have to know something about um, theater, th- those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, so you have to bring something to it. So anyway, that, yeah, yeah, that's how. So that, but here's what happened. That show, when we finished it, the first show with Johnny backstage was an hour long and we had to get rid of half of it. And so we got rid of a lot of this stuff that we shot backstage. Oh, so the thematic stuff was the first to go? Yeah, yeah. It always is. Yeah. The plotty yes, stuff. Because... Because little plots and stories yeah. never go as well as sketches. No, no, you know, and they're only there for you know to, for writing purposes to keep it kind of link you know, everything to keep, together. Yeah, link it together. And so, uh, but we we went with the sketches, and uh, uh, we just had little bits of John Candy, you know, having a nervous breakdown and carrying him out in a stretcher, that kind of stuff. So we had, you know, here we are. We have a show, and we did our first show, and. Uh, we were pleased, sort of pleased with it, because we actually did a show, and it looked like it was okay. And so, um, what was the second one you mentioned? You knew the uh, order. I can't oh, remember. Oh, the second one was, the theme was kind of, um, oh, it was Gus Gustafsson, Security Guard. And oh, then, was and, it? Yeah, Gus, there'd been a murder at SCTV, and Gus was, was oh, um, yeah. uh, putting on an investigation. But then you guys did a movie, which took place ostensibly years earlier, and Gus is in the movie. <laughs> It's great because it doesn't, it doesn't, the physics don't add up, but the comedy no, does. No, no, you would think that we would all be on drugs when we wrote those things, but we weren't. Well, the viewers and, were. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. That was one of our first reviews was High Times Magazine. Joe, the kids in my high school would drop acid at 1130 because SCTV <laughs> came on at 1230. Yeah. You would... There you go. <laughs> Amazing. And boy, we were pretty straight cast at that point. Um, I think Harold had, had finished doing his drug experimentation. Oh, did Harold and, go uh, deep? Oh yeah, in Chicago. Oh God, in Chicago, in Second City, that was that was just a drug. Oh my God, riddled nineteen seventies. What, what what could be more of a coke den than a comedy oh, theater in the seventies? Wow, it was yeah yeah. Belushi just went crazy with drugs. Harold, I remember. Come, they both tried. Um, what the, What's that horse tranquilizer? PCP, PC. Yeah, yeah. they both did PCP. Oh everything. They, every all those hallucinogenics. He was into uh, quaaludes for some reason. He loved quaaludes. He was experimenting with every drug that came out. Certainly, all the uh, hallucinogens. Ketamine is that what it is? Yeah. Ketamine's become uh, very popular in the at the moment. Well, what's, now, what's it's PCP back. then? That's uh, angel PC- dust. Angel Dust, that's, okay, it was that. It, it was Angel Dust. H- Harold did both of those things. Yeah, uh, uh, Harold did both of those things. But he did it more responsibly than John. John would do them on nights of performance. He'd, he'd do them on dr- He'd do the show on, on those drugs. And um, uh, up to a point where Bernie, our dr- producer, had to tell him, look, John, I'm going to get rid of you if you uh, don't stop doing the sh- drugs for the show. But, uh, yeah, he was... He was really into the into that. So yeah, well, people do know about that. Yeah, the '60s. I mean, that was uh, the the local dealer on the block was a guy named Doctor Psychedelic. <laughs> like the Doctor Brano Hour, you played Doctor Psychedelic. Is that where yeah, you got that yeah. name? 
Yeah, it was Dr. Psychedelic. <laughs> oh, so that was just straight Old off Town. the street. There was no fiction there. <laughs> no fiction. It was Dr. Psychedelic. Yeah, that was Dr. Braino hour, I believe. Yeah, and I yeah I wanted to bring him in because I loved that name. That I loved that idea. The guy dealing drugs is Dr. Psychedelic. Uh, part and part of it was my fear of doing drugs, especially marijuana. Of, of uh, you know, going getting going overboard, just getting having a bad trip and jumping out of a window. Uh, which I don't think anyone's ever done on marijuana, but no. we kind of we kind of went in that direction uh, uh, just for fun. But yeah, so that's let's see now where was I now? So yeah, what, that was our first show, and then the second show. So did uh, you guys really we, have a feeling of hey, we did it, we've got a show? Yeah, we were kind of happy. Uh, nobody knew about it. I remember bumping into a, a talent agent at the time in Toronto, pretty pop, famous talent director there and she said oh uh i just saw your television show and i said oh yeah she said i like the stage show much better and i know oh, okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> typical <laughs> shitty comment <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I guess i was thankful at least she watched it we had a few people like marty short who loved it martin short would you know he just he was profuse in his uh you know compliments about the show uh, he just he thought it was a perfect show, you know. He loved it, and I obviously wanted to be on it. But um, yeah, we didn't have, we had no, oh, nobody. We had nobody. <laughs> I mean, there was. I don't even know. We were getting paid two hundred fifty bucks a week Canadian uh, for writing and performing, and so. But we were happy because that was more than we were making on stage. So was there anyone who was supposed to be in the cast or that you wanted in the cast that that didn't work out? Uh no. No, every uh no, um no. Oh, that's um, great. And then so then Harold yeah. split after season one. It was our se- season one, we finished season one. I'll never forget. Uh, we went to New York because by that point we had a, a U.S. distributor, Rhodes, Jack Rhodes, who was going to distribute the shows in the states. So here we were in this dinky station in in Ontario, but also being seen by. And I think we had like close to 100, for some reason, stations in the States uh, through syndication. So uh, we had to go down to New York and do publicity for the show and, you know, make appearances for the upcoming season. And and uh, and um, Sheldon Patinkin said, would you, you want to meet uh, Alan Arkin? I'm going out to, we're good friends. I'm going out to visit him at his home in upstate uh-huh. New York. I said, sure, He's I'd love great, to. Man. He's a... He was a, a yeah he was a, a, an icon at Second City. I mean, yeah. and I'm using it probably in a better sense than it is being used now. I mean, it's just a term, but uh, he certainly was was uh, everybody had great respect for him. The original founders. Yeah. Such so a yeah, I said actor. I'd love to. And then so we went there, and uh, we were we were talking, and he said, uh, yeah, I saw the show, and he was chuckling. He said mm-hmm. he liked the Ben Hur st- sketch we did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, he said he got a big kick out of the Ben Hur sketch. You know, he was quoting lines from it like "I got stuck in this hellhole of Judea" and stuff like that. But I thought, wow, Alan Arkin actually watched our show and he liked that sketch. He liked the Ben Hur sketch that Harold and I wrote. I thought, oh God, I'm in heaven. Is that funny? So the that way was just a comment like that could go a long way. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was fuel. That kept us going. Jesus. Well, the Ben Hur was a great show. It, yeah, and, and we had fun because we had such a low budget. We thought, well, let's just make it work. That bad low budget. So we would put the camera. We'd, we'd shoot the uh, chariot scene, just basically going down a street there at Barbara Green Road with all those trees that were not at all from the Middle East. You know, just a uh, Toronto-looking trees in the winter time <laughs> of all. Anyway. Yeah. No, you never notice so, those things. No one knows. No. So, gosh, we had a lot of fun, and uh, and we had a pickup for the second season uh, because of because of the syndication. And so, oh, and then the second season, I think CBC Canada decided to pick up some of it. I'm not sure how that worked, but they uh, they were involved with some of it. So, wow, our second season was great. We thought, oh boy, and then Andrew Alexander said, uh, boy, I'm really going on here, but. Andrew said, "Okay, uh, we've got to write that. Uh, start writing the second season." And uh, and we sort of said, "Yeah, you know, Andrew, it'd be fun. You know, Bri- oh, Harold's working on this script right now, and that's what it was. Yeah, he said he and he doesn't want to come up to Toronto and work on it. And how? And uh, Andrew said, "Well, I'll send you guys down to L.A. and uh, 
<laughs> we said, okay, great, we'll write our show in L.A. So for our second season, we went down to L.A., and um, and Andrew got us this, this place, nice place in, uh, where the heck was it? Uh, a nice section, a nice section of, uh, of uh, L.A., of uh, near Beverly Beverly Hills, what the heck? Can't remember. Anyway, well, I, I, I've um, always taken the fact that you guys went to Harold as a symbol of how important he was to the show. He must have been if the whole troop's going to go down to L.A. to be with him instead of getting one guy yeah, to come up and yeah. be with you. He was our head writer, and he wrote a lot of those sketches himself for the first season. He yeah. wrote a lot of the yeah, a lot of the uh, commercial parodies. Yeah. What about so, uh, hey, hey, and, what about grapes of mud? Was that yours? It seemed like me and you, Harold. Was that you and Harold? Harold. Yeah, that did, was Harold. Not, yes. Did you write that together? Yeah, yeah. And once again, that was the Chicago Second City thing of uh, doing something with a little bit of uh, you know intelligence, uh, knowledge. You need some knowledge of uh, John Steinbeck and uh, and Grapes of Wrath and the movie and the movie. So um, yeah, we we said yeah, let's do that. Let's let's do. Harold and I dove in. That's and, one of my uh, one of my all time favorites for sure. Really? Yeah, yeah. That was that was so much fun. I I got a chance. I didn't know if I could do Henry Fonda, but I thought I did a decent uh, Fonda uh, for that. Um, Harold and I had so much fun writing that scene with Muley. You uh-huh. know, you can't. You, this 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 land is mine. It's not urine. It's mine. It's not urine. We love that urine line. You know. Yep. And we loved. We wanted to keep. We wanted to use it. We wanted to use it multiple times, you know, urine, it's urine, it's urine, it's not my, but we only used it that once. Yeah, that was so much fun. You know what it was based on? This is really, uh, that, that summer, when was it? No, it was, I guess, yeah, when we finished the show, uh, I went down to LA for a week and they were having terrible uh, rainstorms at the time, mud, mud, rainstorms mudslides. and mudslides. And that was uh, when that one mudslide was so bad that it, uh, it took a, a cemetery and it just brought down a bunch of caskets mm. uh, into people's backyards. That's how bad that rainstorm was, by the way, which Spielberg used later on in a movie. Uh, but um, yeah, it, the, they were bad. That summer was a bad summer for rainstorms and mudslides. So that was uh, that was our premise. Was uh, so the California was having a ton of mudslides, and so we had to leave and go back to Oklahoma where it was dry. That was the whole thing, grapes of mud. I think. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, but we went down. Yeah, we went down to Bel Air. That's where we had the uh, house, uh-huh. nice house in Bel Air, with a swimming pool and everything. God, that was the best. Well, well, how long were we there? A month, I guess. It's five or six weeks, maybe. No, a month. Joe, were you on that Cloud Nine? Month. You had your own comedy sketch show and working yeah. in the sun with your friends. Yeah, yeah. A swimming pool outside. Parenthetically, we had a party there before we left. We we decided to have a party, invite people to our party, and uh, and <laughs> I, I was shocked at some of the people that showed up. We had people from Saturday Night Live. Lorraine Newman came. Uh, Bill Murray came. Steven Spielberg popped up for the party. <laughs> I think I've heard of this party. Is this the one where John Candy put Chevy Chase in a headlock and wouldn't let him out? That's the one. That's the party. <laughs> yep, that's the party. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, that party became well known <laughs> throughout Los Angeles. Uh, everybody had heard of it. It was uh, it was kind of it was a lot of fun. Everybody drinking, and uh, yeah, that was that was the party. That I you know I found out like years later. I talked to somebody say would say, "Did you you guys had that party in Bel Air?" Yeah, yeah, it was us. Oh, and was, uh, Spielberg was a big SCTV fan, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, just after the first season, he was a big SCTV fan. Well, he put you guys, and, a bunch of you, in 1941. Uh, you played the MC. I think, yes, yes. Uh, I think I think he even said, Spielberg said, I'm going to put you in this movie I'm doing. And uh, uh, Dave Dave Thomas was pissed off because... Why? He, he did, well, because didn't, Spielberg didn't pick him for anything in that movie. Uh that's true. But uh, Spielberg said that, well, you know, I'd like to have used that Dave Thomas, to, but tell that little guy, uh, maybe I'll find something for him. And when I told that to Dave, he got, he said very sarcastically, tell that little guy. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and from that point on, Dave did not like Steven Spielberg. <laughs> oh, my God. I bet I'm not going to get into that. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. So that was Harold uh, working on a script at the time called An- Animal House and working with us. 
uh, at that at that place. Mm. And we came up with some good stuff. You know, I mean, that's where Dave came up with Bob Hope, his first Bob Hope impression. Yeah. Uh, we came up with some good funny stuff for that. And um, so, yeah, that was the uh, beginning of our second season. And uh, and that was fun. But we had, but Harold only did a few shows in his second season because uh, because he wanted to be in L.A. Remember, that's when we had Mo Green kidnapped. Yes, of course. We had to get, he was kidnapped we had to get in re- the first or second episode. <laughs> Which yeah. which ended up being the birth of Guy Caballero, as we know. Very it. good, very good. Yes, oh, you're on top of it, Michael. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how Guy Caballero came. Although I must and, say, um, Joe, in the very first episode, you played a guy who was seemed like who was the station manager. He was wearing a white leisure suit, a la Guy. He didn't have the wheelchair, but it looked to me, in retrospect, like that was somehow a proto Guy Caballero even though he wouldn't come back mm. proper until that first episode of season oh, two. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you could be right. You could be right. I can't recall, but that's right. I mean, it was not an, whole... it was an ill-defined character, but the suit was yeah. there and the job was there. Um, you guys just didn't pursue that aspect, that backstage aspect, until later down the road. Yeah, you're right. I, all of that came off of uh, Mo Green and uh, I, being fired. We had to fire Mo Green, and I had... So I, I called him up, it was my voice, and I had used, I was, like, I was improvising, you know, and Harold said, who is this? And I said, this is, I had to come up with a name, and I said, this is, uh, this is Guy Caballero, which is a play on the old gay Caballero. Nobody thing. knows the gay Caballeros anymore. But they, no, no, that's true, they don't, no. they don't. Well, you know, it was, it goes way back to the 20s and 30s, it was just a song about a happy Caballero, uh-huh. and then, and then later on, there was that, you know, it, it had, uh, <laughs> A double meaning, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, yeah. I said this is I, I said this is a guy Caballero, and Harold breaks up. You can see him breaking up. Uh, He's oh, yeah. on the phone with me, and then I had, and then so I thought, well, I got the voice now. I got to come up with the character, and then I thought, well, I want to be a hard hitting character. And what I thought of was Lionel. But once again, talk about you know just choices that are just arcane. <laughs> uh, I said I want to do I want to do Lionel Barrymore from uh, Key Largo. Right. He plays this strong, this hard-hitting right. character in a wheelchair and a white suit and a Panama hat, and he just goes around. You know, he's giving everybody hell. So that's who it was based on loosely at the beginning. But of course, Guy took on a absolute a, a, a true personality of his own. Eventually, yeah, yeah. And I changed. It. I didn't want to look. I didn't want. To, <laughs> it was just not me. Not want to being in the be in the makeup chair anymore. I wanted to make Guy younger. I didn't want to do. Lionel Barrymore in it anymore because it took too much makeup. So the longer any make- sketch player goes with a character, the more they simplify the makeup so it's not exactly. a pain in the it's ass. Very good, very good. You got that exactly. Holy moly! You know this man knows SCTV. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I, I, I really do. Um, I thought we did some good stuff in the second season, and then the show ended. We finished our shows, and then how sad were you guys uh, when the show was over? Because it really ended. I mean, you guys went on with your lives, didn't you? you? That's what happened. We had a meeting with Andrew Alexander, and he said, "Well, just got word from Jack Rhodes, a distributor, can't do, can't pick it up anymore, so we don't have the show." Um, it was in 1979. That would have been our third season, and we didn't have a show. And uh, I was really depressed about it because I'd love, I love Second City, and I loved SCTV. Put a lot into it. Some of the other people didn't it didn't seem to phase them that much, like Gene and uh, who else? G. I know that Gene went on and got another show. He was on a TV show. You raz <laughs> Gene about that on the DVDs oh, about him having one yeah. foot out the door, and he he, he oh, said he yeah. did not. He he said he didn't. He, and he, he said did. he did. <laughs> he did. He had two different shows. He was he was playing around with. <laughs> I, I'd like to go into one of them very quickly. One was called Stay Tuned. And it was a show the CBC was going to do that was going to be in response to Saturday Night Live, only better, as the director Nigel said. <laughs> Nigel <laughs> Naper, only was, better. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, and uh, it was going to be totally Canadian. And uh, and here was the format: as an hour and a half show, it was going to be on Saturday nights, just like Saturday Night Live, after the hockey game. So you had a built-in huge audience, supposedly, with the hockey game, <laughs> and then the show. And uh, they said, oh, by the way, the show's an hour and a half, but depending on how many fights they have during the oh, hockey game. Right. Yeah. And I remember 
one night tuning into it. The hockey game was over. A lot of fights. They had, they come on and do this Saturday Night Live opening big musical number. They do one sketch and then they come back out again and say, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> and it was just a cheap ripoff of uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh. So that's how they were going to be better than Saturday Night Live is to basically imitate Saturday Night Live with a show that could be an hour, could be an hour and a half, could be 20 minutes, oh depending God. on hockey game fights. But anyway, I never let Gene forget that, boy, I'll tell you. What you guys managed to squeeze out from Cleveland, though, in the interim, did it feel? Did that feel like you were getting something going again? Uh, from Cleveland, yeah. You know, 79, all of a sudden we had nothing. Uh, that was strange, and it was really hard. But interestingly enough, work started coming in. Like we, Dave and I had an offer from HBO to write a script, a special. Uh, I got two movies in 1979. And we, I got uh, 19, 1941, and then I got Used Cars. It turned out to be a nice, nice little movie, didn't it? It's a terribly <laughs> funny movie. Yeah, yeah. It's a, <laughs> and I got that by chance because I replaced uh, John Candy, who was, who was hired on to do it. Oh, really? And they had, they had to, had to get rid of John. They had to fire John. Um, <laughs> Um, typical John. Typical John. What would he do? Well, while he, when they're making the film, uh, everybody sort of knew John was funny and his reputation from those SCTV shows. So he had a little bit of clout there. And uh, they were doing a show, they were doing a scene where they had to break into a, I guess, a car dealership and steal some stuff. And right. um, yeah. And then John said, um, and they were talking about having disguises. And John said, I know what we can do. He said, why don't we get, I don't know if you remember these things or not. Back then, they were kind of st stupidly popular. They were they were uh, glasses, um, horn rim glasses like this. But, oh, but they had again, like instead of, you know, instead of having the fake nose at the end, you know, which was a gag, they used to have a big nose, big hook nose attached to the uh, glasses. Uh, Woody Allen used it in one of his movies. Um, but then again, John said, uh, we should use those other things that just came out these other glasses which are glasses with a penis an erect penis at the end <laughs> okay and they they said okay let's do it so they shot it they shot the scene with it with the dick noses yeah <laughs> well the studio was apoplectic they hated it really they hated it yeah and oh, that came yeah. and that came down on john candy no it just it came down on spielberg um and and bob zemeckis because yeah, Spielberg was producing uh, Zemeckis, Zemeckis. Directed it, Zemeckis. Yeah, and I don't know if they said get rid of that actor or what, but uh, they said get rid of that scene and get rid of that actor. Jesus. So they had to, oh, no, they didn't have to get rid of John. Then it turned out that John's agent had booked him for two movies simultaneously. <laughs> and John had to go to Spielberg and say, <laughs> Stephen, <laughs> my agent booked me for <laughs> two movies. So Jesus, he, he was that. in too and, many Spielberg movies at once. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they brought me in to, to replace him, and uh, I still wish Zemeckis would have let me use that mustache for that sleazy lawyer, but he didn't want. He said, "No, don't do it." But anyway, it turned out to be a good movie. I got the chance to watch. You know, uh, I got a chance to work with uh, some good people. Yeah. Um, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Jack I watched, Warden. Jack Warden. We became good buddies on that movie. But he, I, I liked him a lot. Oh, really? What a terrific actor. Oh, and good sense of humor. We, we just Funny. joked all the way through it. Uh, and Yeah. And, of course, I got, I got a chance to meet um, Wyatt Earp himself. Oh, uh, uh, Kurt, Kurt Russell? I got a chance to work, meet him, yeah. He became a big fan of SCTV after that, brother. Or maybe, no, he was even during then. Oh, uh, so Everybody was. Yeah, so I made more in 1979. Then we had that From Cleveland thing, which, yeah. I didn't like at all. Had a weird like vibe. Doing... The whole thing had a weird vibe. Yeah. It just surfaced was... on YouTube. I watched it years and years ago at the Museum of Broadcasting on tape. Uh -huh. But um, oh. now somebody just put it up on YouTube for the fans who are interested in From Cleveland. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a relic. Mm -hmm. And that was our the producer, Rocco Urbisi, was from Cleveland. And he wanted to do a show there, a special, and he wanted us to be in it. And he wanted us to stay at Swingo's Hotel. Swingo. Uh, it's apparently a very popular place there that Frank Sinatra stayed at. Um, that was the whole thing. He wanted to do that, and he wanted us to stay at Swingo's. And we had to write it. And um, uh -huh. 
and I didn't like Cleveland, you know. I did, I got very bad vibes off of the city. A uh, lot of angry white males there uh, because that was during the time of the, the steel mill closures. Mm. All of the industry was closing down. It was called the Rust Belt. That's when it became the Rust Belt. Yeah. All those guys were out of work. They were all out of work. Oops. And they were just angry. Mm just angry about that so that wasn't very nice you know uh, and then we ended up doing that boxing match <laughs> stupid our, our producer our, B, our bc loved uh loved dave thomas's john uh bob hope so much that he had him in that boxing yeah uh ring come down and do his invitation in the boxing ring and that that was terrible a terrible idea and he, you know the audience didn't know who he was uh i said i said rocco can we you give him a voiceover, an introduction, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Hope, or ladies and gentlemen, uh, D- Dave Thomas as Bob Hope. He said, no, nah, no, nah, you don't need it. He said, the music will be enough because they were playing thanks for the memory. Oh, no. But, I don't mean that. But the, cro- the crowds aren't going to get that. No, and not only that, they were so uh, <laughs> outrageously out of control that you couldn't, they were screaming and yelling. You couldn't hear it. And, and the guy came up and told Dave, you better get off stage. We're going to cause a riot. Uh, and to this day, it's the... Worst I've ever seen a, a comedy performer bomb. Oh, <laughs> no. I mean, the audience never let him say it. They just screamed over him and then started throwing chairs. It, it, and the guy it, told Dave, you know, he's told Dave, he said, the cop said, get off stage. You're going to cause a riot. So they pulled him off stage. It's a very short mm. segment. So whatever happened, it, 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 uh, yeah. It's short. It wasn't much to go in, with. <laughs> well, they, they cut it. They had to cut it down a lot. Because of graphic boy, violence? That, yeah, it was just a terrible. The, the fans were ugly. They were they were angry because uh, uh, somebody had just won a championship that they hated. They didn't want to see win, uh, and so that that um, that turned them ugly. And and fortunately, they after we, we we said we better get out of here, uh, and we left. And, and <laughs> there were afterward there was a riot. There were fights. Oh, there were no. fights. Yeah. So anyway, that was seventy nine. That was the nine. That was the year we didn't do SCTV. Uh, you know, I wasn't conscious and, of the show until 80, but I would have been heartbroken had I lived through that. You guys lived through it. So then famously, Dr. Allard saved the show, right? Like, very good. Very good. Once again. Yep. Boy, you're like Brian Linehan. Boy, you've run your homework. <laughs> I am. I'm the Brian <laughs> Linehan of SETV. <laughs> but anyway, so here we are in Cleveland and the show's winding down. Uh, the You know, shooting the production is winding down. Andrew Alexander drops by. He drop, flies in. He says, guys, um, I have a proposition for you. He said, uh, how would you guys like to do SCTV again? And uh, but he said, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, of course. He said, all right. Uh, now, here's the deal. Because we don't have, you know, we're not on syndication. We don't have any money. He said, we have a backer in Edmonton, Canada, a Dr. Allard, who will finance our show, deficit finance our show. Um, all, he, all he asks is that we shoot it in Edmonton. And uh, he said, yeah, we have any takers? Anybody want to do it? No one. <laughs> no one wanted to do it except me, me and Dave Thomas. Once again, Gene out the, out the door, Catherine out the door, John Candy out the door. Um, yep, bailing out. And so uh, there was just Dave and myself. And Andrew said, you think you and Dave can put a cast together and writers? He said, sure. You, you know, both of you guys, you know, you know the show. He said, sure. Uh, he said, I'll fly you up to Edmonton and show you the studios and everything. And he, he flew us up to Edmonton. We met the people. They were nice group, great group, you know, small, small, tiny studios, much smaller than Global. But um, they were all sort of interested in having us come up there. And they were getting, re- <laughs> David Steinberg, the stand-up comic, was just getting ready to leave because they pulled the plug on his show mm. uh, midway in, into a season, they pulled the plug on it, and um, it was a different. It was a talk show, a sit-down talk show. Oh what yeah, he had a lot that? of those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Doctor Allard one day poked his head in to see what they were doing. Whatever Steinberg was, was talking about, he didn't like, and he said, "That's it. Get rid of that guy." Uh, and so, come they, on. unceremoniously, David was out, and we were in. And there was just me and Dave looking at the studio and everything and meeting the people. And we said, okay, let's go. And, and, uh, and um, Andrew said, okay, uh, let's start working on a show in March of uh, 1980. 
you got to hire some writers and a cast. And so um, Dave and I had to come up with a cast because Gene left the show and John <laughs> left the show <laughs> and Catherine left the show. Uh, so we had to come up with a cast and we had some people with Second City there, Tony Rosado, which who's doing pretty well on stage and so was Robin Duke. We said, well, we could use Tony and Robin. And then Dave said, um, now this is guy I know, Rick Morantis. He's a DJ here, but he's really good. Uh, you want to bring him on as a writer? He's a good writer. He can write. And I, I think he's a good performer. I said, sure, sure. Let's bring him on. So we brought on Brian. We brought on So Rick. you you thumbs up Rick Moranis in the cast, sight unseen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I took Dave's word for it that he was good, you, you know. And yeah. But And I had seen, of course, I had worked with, I, I knew those, Tony and Robin. I'd worked with them and when they were in like the, the touring company and stuff like that. So I knew that. I knew about them. And so there were, we said, okay, that's what we're going to go with. Tony, Robin, Rick, me, and you. And did, be our cast. Five. did Andrea weigh in? Did she want out the way Catherine no, did? No, Andrea went out the door. She didn't want to go either. She didn't want to join us. Um, no, we had to go without Andrea too. She She backstabbed us. <laughs> well, I'm kidding, of course. Yes. Uh, well, it worked out in the did. end. She bailed out. Uh, I heard yeah, so Eugene we, Levy saying he maybe he wasn't that optimistic about it coming together, but then he said he saw. I don't know if you guys shot something and he saw it or if he saw the facilities, but he said he saw what it looked like and said, "This is good. I got to get. I've got to get back." Yeah, uh, it probably he saw one of the shows. I guess. Um, so he wasn't in the first. No, the first no, throw of the third season. No, no, no I didn't no, know that. Even, no, he just did the last three or four shows. But the first show was um, uh, was the um, it was the 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 telethon thing. The um, Lee Iacocca's rock concert was the first one. Gene was in that. Yeah, well, you know. Oh, you shot him out of shoot, sequence. Yeah, you shoot him out of sequence. I yeah. mean, the ones he shoot last could be in the first show. By the time they start airing, yeah. Especially with SCTV, you guys seem to be all over the place on your timeline. Wow. But you know, we got up there. We we got had our writing offices in uh, Toronto, and there would be me and Dave and Rick, and we needed some other writers too. And um, this is interesting. Um, Harold Ramis said, said he couldn't do it. He said, "But why don't you try uh, Joe's brother, Paul Flaherty, and this Dick Blasucci?" Uh, he said, "I saw a script they wrote. It's pretty funny." And so I knew Dick from Chicago. He was in a touring company. I directed him. Obviously, I knew Paul. Uh, mm-hmm. So I said, uh, okay, and they sent the script up. Dave said, uh, let's take a look at the script, and we looked at it, and it's a funny script. And Dave said, well, you want to bring him in? And I said, yeah, let's, let's bring him in, Dick and, Dick and uh, Paul. So we brought them in, and that was our writing offices. It was just me and Dave, Rick, Paul, and Dick. That was mostly our, our writing offices. They're in Toronto. So Brian Murray and wrote then, for the second season because his name's in the second, credits for a little bit of this. Stuff. Yes, yeah. Brian joined. Yes, he joined us. He I, when we were in Bel Air, he came by and wrote some sketches with us. Um, I see. And uh, Dave Thomas always loves to thank him for helping him develop the Bob Hope character, the Bob Hope Desert Classic. And uh, so he wrote some sketches for that. Yeah, I get it. As, so, but now we're in season and, three. So now you're bringing on Paul Flaherty, Dick Blasucci. And didn't Mike yep. Short come on that year? Did Mike come on that year? I, I don't think he did. I think he came on. That's a good question. I thought he came on the first year on NBC, but I thought I, I remembered him seeing season three. But you'd know better, of course. Um, but he obviously mm-hmm. he did. He was on board by season four, which was the big one. Yeah. How you much? Know, he of, may have. He may. I have. feel like I he did. Remember, I feel like he did. Just I from just don't credits. Remember him. I don't remember him being in that writing room, but it could have been. Oh, he could. Of course, he could have came out to Edmonton and. Yes, yes. All right. So by season three, Joe, did you guys yeah. process change much? Doing the show? The, yeah. Production in the show? No. Especially just no. from writing to, to, to shooting? No. No, no. Same thing. Same, come up with a concept, write it out, shoot it. Same thing. Um, and thank goodness Rick was not only just a great performer, but a good writer too. And that really helped I feel because, like Rick's know, voice was one of the big factors in the show being reignited in season three. Because yeah, you guys yeah. did rediscover the show, looked different, it felt different, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It, it just had a kind of different tone. And Rick's voice is really strong, clear. Yeah, yeah. Didn't know, didn't realize that until we, you know, we shot. But uh, 
the tiny, I, I, I love that little tiny studio there at ITV in Edmonton with its little cafeteria. Um, the little studio, there was only one studio, and it's a small studio, and then there was another tinier one right next to it. Uh, and that's where we shot all of our stuff. It was amazing. Except you guys uh, had some really out. great shows that season. My factory myself was a killer, <laughs> and uh, you were predi- you. you you were particular. You. you were the standout in that one. The guy kept crying all the time. The <laughs> and uh, yes. what else? Midnight Express special was was uh, a, 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 also a standout. That was good. That was, and uh, they did a good job on that. And uh, that was Paul and Dick and um, Gene mostly. Yeah. Yeah, on that one. Yeah, yeah, and um, what a great season! Yes, weird we, and just and then, weird. And of course, you know, CBC said they'd pick our show up, but we had to do some Canadian content, and that was the beginning of Bob and Doug. Well documented. And, and halfway through the season, we found out that Canada fell in love with Bob and Doug. That they were using, like, we found out that in Parliament they were using the term "hoser." Just shut up, you hoser. <laughs> And, uh, That's stupid. <laughs> you know, hoes. I know. I know. <laughs> well, who would have thought those two hosers would break up the show? Oh, wow. Yeah. They they just uh, they caught on. So in Canada, it became pretty popular, and and, and uh, ultimately it was in the states too. So people liked Bob and Doug, and uh, unfortunately, um, no, it was good. It was good all around. But I mean, whatever. That's the way. It well, went. it's a. It, it has to do with fame and fortune. That's all. Um, it seems irresistible that when those opportunities come, that you have to take it. Like those, yeah. Like Belushi yeah, and Aykroyd yeah. had to leave to make the Blues Brothers because it was there for it, them. Right now, the question is, they're tied contractually to a show. So, what do they do on that show when they want to be off of that show and doing bigger things? Does it affect their personality? I found out after years of observation. Yes, it does. They all became. They all become miserable. They all become miserable <laughs> doing the show that they don't want to do because it's keeping uh, their career back. It's mm-hmm. understandable, but um, but that's what happened. It happened with our show. Um, not as bad as some of the stuff on you know Saturday Night Live and well, other your, shows. Your but, people are good. I mean, it does. It broke our hearts that you know that John Candy left the show and Catherine left the show. But it, uh, I guess good. Well, pe- thank God, good people are hard to keep. That was tough when that season that Rick and Dave decided to leave because they were getting famous. And I'll never forgive Catherine for this. She decided to leave too. And uh, I thought, oh man, that's that's a death blow. You know, those those three people. And um, we had to do another season. And fortunately, fortunately, uh, Marty came aboard. And I think at that point. I and, feel uh, like he did the, a similar thing that Rick Moranis did. Which was yeah. kind of in, inject the show with a, a, yeah. a, a, a sort of a new angle. Yes. yes, and so and Martin Short is different. He's different than the most of you guys. Oh, defi- definitely, definitely, different sensibilities, different sense of humor. Fun to work with. Paul and Dick love writing with him. But um, yeah, so so we had to get together. That we had our cast. Thank God, thank God, John stuck around one more season. But uh, we were able to put together some pretty good shows with those three li- missing. You know, one of my favorite shows was the CBC parody show we did. Uh, yeah, that was one of the, the Cana- great episodes the Canadians. for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. you guys had so many good shows that season. Yeah. There was only 12 and, of uh, them. Yeah, and uh, we ended up winning more, nominated for more Emmys than we did the year before. Yeah, you guys had like five out of six of uh, the nominations. Yes. Yeah. And one cat, I think, yeah, one, one, one. We took had all the categories, but but uh, we did we did that, and then uh, some other stuff that I really liked uh, in in that last in that season. We did it with that. We're missing Dave and Rick and Catherine. I, I'm amazed that we got through it. But Gene came through. Catherine seemed to have a revolving door policy at the show. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yes, she would yeah. show up here and there, and you'd hear her voice off camera once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, I should say, um, um, y- you want to use me in this show? Can I write something for it? Of course, <laughs> Catherine, yes. And of course, one time she wrote a whole sketch with for Jewel Hallmark. <laughs> yes, on the Christmas <laughs> show. Yeah, and I thought, what the hell? Why is Jewel, <laughs> why does Jewel have such a big part on that show? I wouldn't mind being having that part. But uh, <laughs> It's a good sketch, though. It's funny. Oh, it wasn't. He was, he was great. He yes, was great at yes, it. Yes, he was. 
He, the remarkable Jewel Hallmark, so likable. He was likable on screen. What a great personality. Such yeah. a good move you guys putting uh, the crew on camera. Mm, thank you. I love doing that. It was one of my favorite things from season one. I loved getting the crew involved, pulling them in <laughs> when they weren't expecting it. Paul yeah. Rock was on in season one a bit, and then, yeah, but then Jamie. more and more, and we get to, because then, you know, it's just good for the fans. We get to know Bev and uh, right. Jewel Bev, and, Jules and, and Judy. Judy and all the stars. We made it through that season. We did some good shows. Oh, my God. Um, season five. And then season six, people have the temerity to, to, to talk shit about season six, which is I thought was just as good as anything that you guys did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're in the minority. I'll tell you that. Uh, I know, but there's so much. Because I have patience, Joe. Because those, yeah. that's what those scenes in season six took. Gene Levy, seven minute piece. He did that. You, Max Lansky, the rich guy you're on. It's just Gene for like, and then he took a break, comes back, does another seven minutes. I know. I uh, know. No, I love it. I love all God. of it. it you, but yeah, I got to tell you, you're in the minority. Trust me, you're in the minority. What were but you we guys thinking at the time? You know, we were experimenting with testing the audience's patience. <laughs> See, we really were. I don't know why. We would want to. We would try to go as long as we could, <laughs> setting up a joke. That doesn't even like, count Six Gun Justice, which were like half no, hour episodes. That's right. Yes, uh, th those were fun to do. I, that was my own childhood, uh, you know, Western uh, input. Yeah, serial Slade input. Cantrell. Um, but Jewel, Jewel said but, no one told him it was going to be in black and white. Oh, uh, he cost no, him the whole thing, and not. then found out. Oh, this is monochrome. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's. Oh, that's true. We neglected to tell him. I always, the you know, they were black and white, all of those movies. So, yeah, but we just didn't tell him yet. No, he should have figured, listen, but there it is. Yeah, I'm telling you, it was it was difficult because John had left the show. And um, so there was just Andrea, Jean, myself, and Marty. Who else? Well, you brought, in, right? you brought in John Hempel and uh, Mary Charlotte right. Wilcox. Yeah. Oh, right. Jer yeah. Mary and she Charlotte was and John. so good. I mean, obviously Hemphill's great, but she was also really, really oh, good. Oh, love Mary Charlotte. Love her. Wait. No. G um, Andrea was on the show too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No. You so, said Andrea. Oh, I did. Yeah. But you know, we we did uh, things like Canadian practical gaffes and amusements, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we would really test, as I said, the patience of the audience. Having Dougal Curry go up and ring the doorbell. And then run down and hide. Yeah, and I call that up. tantric comedy. So we were doing that, you know, uh, um, and we did that that sketch with Catherine, which is funny, with Marty playing Wink Wink Wolferlon. Oh, was that where the, the, it was the, mostly about locomotion? Just was, getting was just a, getting the, from one place yes, to another? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. It was, we're going to go from one studio to the other, and Paul and Dick said, well, let's just make it a long, a long Boring. And then a climb, and then a little climb. <laughs> yeah. And once again, what was that based on? Uh, pu pushing the audience, just pushing the audience. Just a, uh, it was just a joke about really n a non-joke thing. I don't know why we were into that, but uh, yeah, but it was tough. It was that was the toughest season, or the only the only um, June, Gene, me, Marty, Andrea. That was it, right? Yeah, but yeah. by this time you had a whole nest of writers. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did have the writers. Yeah, how'd that go? Well, we had picked up those writers along the way. I mean, McCandrew and and uh, and uh, well, sure, Doug Steckler. Yeah. yeah, they'd been around. Were with us for quite a while. Yeah, and uh, Doug Steckler, you know, he wrote all of the um, the um, Mellonville stuff. All of those what, middle, like Mellonville Mellonville calendar Mellonville calendar. Uh, the what was the name of that stupid restaurant? In Mellonville. Oh, the Driftwood Inn. Driftwood Inn. He wrote all of those commercials. Yeah. That yeah. gives it the flavor. That that gives it that nice melon. Uh-oh. I'm getting signals from my producer. Mm -hmm. There is, you yeah. know, Joe, this always happens. When I saw you on Couch Candy and when I've heard you on other podcasts, usually it's it, we spend so much time, meaning we interviewers, on, on like Second City stuff and all that, that by, that by the time we get to SCTV, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. Have you Jeez. noticed that? I'm sorry. Yeah, too much backstory. I'm sorry. No, not at but all. He, but maybe we could do a part um, two. Yeah, I'd like that. We could pick up there. Because there's uh, so, I mean, I barely, I feel like I've only scratched the surface on uh, all the <laughs> stuff I'd like to talk about about SCTV. But I'm equally obsessed with Second City, too. 
Well, we didn't get to this talk about the Scorsese thing either, which I guess there's not really that much to say, but I, I did want to ask you about it a little bit, um, which word is it's on the shelf. Yeah, word is it is. And uh, I can't talk about it. I'm oh, just too oh, bitter. Oh, oh too, bitter. too it's, bitter. It's it's not a legal have, thing. It's just a bit. <laughs> no, 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 it's not a legal thing. With me, it's a, it's a bitter thing. But, uh, I mean, I just was so upset with how everything developed. And then didn't happen? So did he Let try tell and you, fail? Yeah, what can you Let say? Me, I'll just try to compress this. I thought we could do it. I thought we could. In, it, we agree. He's such a, he was such a huge SETV fan. Um, we could incorporate him in a good, funny way. Um, there are many different ways we could have done it. Some of the cast, didn't for some reason, didn't want him involved. It was weird. How could he not be involved uh, if it's his thing? Like, didn't want him on camera? I, I, Is it on camera present? They had this attitude, what's, what did he have to do with SCTV? Um, uh, other than being one of our biggest fans ever. Um, wow. And we did, like, multiple parodies of his work on SCTV. Uh, sure. Yeah, that was... They... Uh, I don't know why they... When Netflix just said, here's the show, and it's got to be Martin Scorsese and SCTV. We're not going to just buy a clip show. Um, so there was some of the people, I can't understand why they balked at that. I, I can't understand. And there's more than that, but uh, it just uh, eventually, I'm going to write a book about it or do an expose or maybe an article in Atlantic. That's what I'll do. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, hey, Joe, uh, we got to wrap yeah. it up. Uh, on sure. this show, I, I've taken uh, carried on the tradition of blowing people up, and I was hoping perhaps you would you'd blow up. With well, them. I certainly wouldn't mind it. No, um, no you're you're I'm the good. creator of the blow up, of course. Big Jim McBob and Billy Saul here. Yeah, that's right. I guess I am. Well, Harold Ramis is really the the, the creator. Oh, did, uh, the did, first did, creator. Did, yeah, is he the one who thought they all should blow up and then blow people? No, up? No, he just came up with the very first farm film report. Got it. Uh, no, actually, the very first thing he did was the farm report, yep. and then the farm film. Yes. Yeah. 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 They did the blow ups didn't yeah. come till much later. No. No. Till what later. Interesting evolution. Uh, it was our chance to to take our dig at celebrities. Yeah. Uh, why 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 do a sketch about them when you can just blow them up? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, sure, Michael. If you want me to blow you up, that'd be great. We can go with the old sign-off that Billy Saul and Big Jim did, and I think that'd be an honor to do that together with you. Well, I, I haven't, I'm not asked to do Big Jim McBob very much, so it might be fun to kind of do him. Oh, I'd love it. Uh, this has really been a treat, Joe, a real rare treat. So uh, for the SCTV podcast, this is Big Jim McBob and Michael Delaney saying, May the good Lord take a liking to you and blow you up real soon. soon.